This lesson focuses on the industrialization of education. By the end of the presentation, the student will be able to analyze the origins, organization, and effects of the industrialization of public education. The student will also be able to evaluate the community college system so that we can build upon strengths and address gaps. Please keep in mind to observe your internal process, to display courage and respect for yourself and for others, and to question your assumptions about our current educational system and where you think you would like to see it go in the future. Sir Ken Robinson has done a TED Talk about the changing paradigms in education. So I would ask you at this time to go ahead and play the PowerPoint. It's about 11 minutes long. Um, be careful as he has a very squeaky marker in the beginning of the presentation. But he presents for you the model of education, the current model of education that we have in the United States and how it, how it became that way and where he thinks that it ought to be going in the future. So what did you think of that information? It was a pretty interesting TED Talk, I think. So let's review a little bit. What was the Industrial Revolution? Well, basically, we used to be a bunch of farmers. It's called an agrarian society. And at the point of the Industrial Revolution, as technology improved and increased, we became more of an industrial economy. Um, there were a lot of factory workers. In the 18th century, there were new forms of energy, such as gasoline and steam, and that helped with production in terms of machines and factories and assembly lines. Everything became more efficient and easy to plan, but it was also very standard. You had to know how to run the assembly line, what you had to do, what your responsibilities were. So what kind of education did that require? Well, let's look at what type of economy we've had across the decades here. So when you look at 1900 at the turn of the century, farming accounted for 30% of the economy, manufacturing accounted for 40%, and service professions accounted for 20%. As we move now into the year 2000, and now we're into 2020, farming only accounts for 2% of the economy. Manufacturing has decreased to 22% of the economy, while service industries have increased to 70% of the economy. So available jobs, the trend is that service jobs are going up, and that's what you're doing. You're going into a service job. So there are two types of service jobs. There can be one um, that is considered low wage, no benefits, with no future, or there can be a career service job with benefits and a living wage, but that requires a higher education and certifications. Again, this is the program that you are entering in. So here are some current statistics. You can take a look at these at your leisure. Um, basically, it shows that um, service, service occupations are growing and will continue to grow through 2028. Um, it shows you six of the 10 fastest growing occupations um, that are related to healthcare. Um, occupational therapy, physician's assistants. It shows you the um, employment change and also shows you the medium income. So nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, those are looking pretty good. You can also take a look at these statistics uh, at your leisure, the projected annual rate of change. So it is showing in blue, those are service providing industries in the um, red are the goods producing and you can see that the blue um, is is ahead of the uh, goods producing the manufacturing if you will and then finally the labor force share by age group so this shows the change in the age of the workforce from 1998 projected through to the year 2028 and basically what it shows is that the um, amount of people that are 55 and older continues to increase in the workforce. So for example, in 1998, 12%, approximately 12% of the workforce was 55 or older. It's doubled, will have doubled by 2028 to 25.2%. Whereas the other age groups are either remaining stable or actually decreasing as in the 16 to 24 year old category. 
Why do you think that is? What are some reasons that you can think of for why that might be happening? Well, I can think of a couple. One reason is that people might be continuing to work longer. Another might be that our baby boomers, there are a lot of baby boomers, so there's a larger population of people 55 and older. So social conditions leading to the debate about education and industry. So the needs of industry in the early 1900s, you had urban factory workers. Some non-English speaking immigrants were in the urban centers. And if you were in a factory, think of um, a car auto manufacturing uh, assembly line. You need strong and coordinated bodies to work those assembly lines. And you need workers that are gonna show up and do what you tell them, do the work, get it done um, without much follow up. They need to be pretty independent, but they need to know what to do. So in order to educate people to be able to do that type of work, that was how public schools were designed. If you remember in the video, Sir Ken Robinson's video, there was no um, educational system. It was generally if you went to Jesuits, the churches, that's how you got educated. So we had to come up with some type of educational system. So what happened is the industry requirements for public schools in the early 1900s, we wanted to produce students who could memorize their task, follow orders, show up on time, be dependable. What are some other characteristics that you might be able to think of? So you wanted somebody that com could come into the auto factory assembly line, they would be able to put together the part they needed to put it on the assembly line, and their person would take it off and assemble the car. Not much independent thought or creativity or critical thinking in that type of job. So the education was dominated by scheduling. The students were taught not to ask questions because they wanted to get students into school and out of school so they could get out on the job. If they took too much time, um, the timing would be off and um, you wouldn't be able to put enough students through to make money and uh, the students couldn't catch up if they, if they didn't understand. And the emphasis was more on content, not the process. So it would be more along the lines of, um, of remembering of the knowledge piece and the comprehension, not more of the higher order functions. So the person would memorize what needed to be done, didn't have to think things over. Uh, they memorize the content, they would take a multiple choice exam, and you really, they didn't have to think. Because if you're on an assembly line, you don't really have to think. You put the pieces together. And if the machine breaks down, you call somebody who knows about the machine to fix it. So the schools and lessons supported some learning styles more than other learning styles. So maybe people that were auditory that could listen, but really not much with um, kinetics, being able to move or, or manipulate different types of um, items. We were also told and learned that hard work is the path to riches. That's what we were told. So my generation, I'm Gen X, that's what we were told. So the question still remains, why aren't we all rich? So what happened is then with the Industrial Revolution, with, the, um, with going from the farm society to the industrial side, that's, that's where education went in that direction. And it really hasn't moved much from there. We are starting to see education um, change, which is really exciting. I've really seen a lot of that in the last maybe five to 10 years, where because students need to pr become professionals now, healthcare workers, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, the living wage careers require professional behaviors and skills. They require creativity. They require a lot of critical thinking and being able to think on your feet and problem solve. So you have to think rather than follow orders. That's not to say that you don't follow the orders of the physician, but you're a team that works together and your uh, opinion is valued in terms of the care plan for the patient. Sometimes you have to lead and take action. You really have to communicate effectively and listen to others. When you're on an assembly line, you don't really have to do that. A lot of times you have um, earplugs in or headphones on, not much communicating or listening. You have to be self-sufficient, self-manage. You still have to be on time and do those types of things. But are there some other skills, any other skills that you can think of to be a, um, to be a professional? 
So when we look at uh, this, again, uh, goes towards Bloom's taxonomy, which we will look at in the next lesson in a little more detail. We look at the different types of questions in the educational system. They're questions which we call knowledge-based questions. Knowledge-based questions are, do you know the information or do you not know the information? So for example, this question, what is splenomegaly? So you may or may not know the answer to that question. Uh, your choices are an enlarged spleen, a splenic tumor, an infection in the spleen, an atrophied spleen. So if you maybe have some notion of, of Latin or maybe could take a pretty good guess, you would probably guess that spleno means spleen. So it has something to do with spleen. Well, all four choices have something to do with the spleen. If you look at the suffix megaly, that means enlarged or bigger. So then you would be able to, to choose uh, choice A, the enlarged spleen. But basically this is a you know it or you don't know it kind of question not a whole lot of thought has to go into it. If you move up the ladder to a comprehension level question, not only do you have to know about the spleen or what splenomegaly is, you have to know when you might see that particular condition. So a client with infectious mononucleosis, mono, is at risk for which condition? Hypertension, blindness, splenomegaly, or hypoglycemia? So hypertension is increased blood pressure, blindness, you're not able to see anything, splenomegaly is an enlarged spleen, and hypoglycemia is uh, decreased blood sugar. So we know there's infection, it tells us there, infection, there is an infection, um, that it does have to do with mononucleosis, which is the Epstein-Barr virus, and I do have to know that splenomegaly can occur when a person has infectious mononucleosis. So C is the correct answer. So not only did I have to know what splenomegaly was, I had to know when um, I might be seeing that, when it could be present. And actually the spleen can burst, just FYI, um, in a situation like that. So keep that in mind for one of the next questions. So now again, we move further up the pyramid to a critical thinking test item where we really have to pull all the information together. And these are the types of questions that you are more than likely going to be seeing in the RCP and RNVN programs because we are asking you to take the information and apply it to a situation. So for example, which instruction is most important for the healthcare provider to provide a client who has splenomegaly? So we have to know uh, what splenomegaly is. We have to then <clears throat> think about what, what do we need to tell the patient? What do they need to be careful of? What are the ramifications if the patient does something wrong? So if they have an enlarged spleen, do we want them to take frequent rest periods? Do we want them to not lift heavy objects? Do we want them to eat nutritious meals? Or do we want them to avoid unnecessary stress? Well, if you think about infectious mononucleosis, <clears throat> generally we want those patients to take frequent rest periods. However, that's not what this question is asking about. It's asking about a client who has splenomegaly and would they, um, what do we need to teach them? So what I just told you earlier was that sometimes the spleen can burst. So now which one of those four things do you think would be the best answer? B, do not lift heavy objects. So let's get to the final question here. This is an even better critical thinking test item. We're gonna put this in, in truly into a scenario where we have to look at many different factors in order to answer the question. A male client has developed splenomegaly secondary to infectious mononucleosis. All right, we know that we've got the splenomegaly, we know they have the infectious mononucleosis. Which factor in the patient's health history is most important for the healthcare provider to consider when developing a teaching plan for the client? So the question isn't really asking us so much about the infectious mononucleosis, it's asking us about the splenomegaly and what we need to, what we need to teach them but it's not really asking us what to teach them, it's asking us what we need to consider in the patient's history 
individualizing their care when developing a teaching plan. So our options are the patient's favorite meal is hamburgers and fries. They often sleep 12 to 14 hours per night on the weekends. They lift weights for recreation, bodybuilding, or they drink one to two beers daily and three to four on weekends. So taking everything that we've talked about in the previous questions and the information provided in this slide, which factor in the patient's health history is most important to consider? C, lifts weights for recreation bodybuilding, because we already said we didn't want him lifting anything because his spleen might burst. Good job. Hopefully you're able to see the, uh, the difference and the way that the questions are leveled to a, a increasingly more difficult and or more thoughtful uh, thought process in order to answer the question. So now that we've done that, it's time for you to take a break and come back and then you can watch the next PowerPoint on the industrialization of education part two, what schools and learning should be. Thank you.